thank you again for coming. I'm so delighted to have you. As I, I said uh, in my first question to you when we sent the initial draft over, I read your bio and it's like, okay, instant fan. You're such a Galatinian. So like, so, and I, you know, I'm a new, fairly new to NYU, but I really connected with all the Galatinians. Um, yeah, because we're, we're the kooky fun ones. Right, exactly. And I'm from being fun. So it was like you were my people. I, I got that. Yeah. Um, so I'd love to, and I, your career has really uh, proven that sort of the truth of that interdisciplinary Gallatin method. So can, I, can we first talk about what drew you from Texas to Gallatin and what you studied while you were there? Sure. So I, when I was at Gallatin, you know, they have concentrations, not majors. They're very, very proud of that. And I'm very proud to say that my concentrations were political science and theater. Um, and my colloquium had it with, excuse me. So let me start over. So they're very proud of concentrations. My concentrations at Gallatin were political science, theater with a minor in Africana studies. And my colloquium to graduate, because that's a very important part of the Gallatin experience, right. was actually titled the political role of theater and film with an emphasis on how it impacts how we view race in America. Yeah, cool. Which is, and um, I'm actually, because I am a bit of a, a nerd and I say that with pride. As uh, you should. Thank you. <laughs> I, I am still in touch with Professor Dinwiddie and some of the other wonderful people um, yes. who taught me at Gallatin. But the irony is, you know, all of what I do in my career really does tie all of those things together. Mm -hmm. So I believe my Gallatin experience and my Gallatin colloquium served me quite well. Right. It's interesting. I think we live in an increasingly interdisciplinary world. So I think that Gallatin thinking was sort of ahead of the curve, honestly. Um, I call, I call Montes, excuse me, I call Gallatin Montessori for grownups. Yeah. <laughs> I went to Montessori school as a kid, you know, and you're building blocks on one day, you're reading books on another day. And that really was my Gallatin experience. And it's, it's interesting that you said that that's becoming more common, the interdisciplinary, inter interdisciplinary approach or being a multi-platform, multi-hyphenate. But I remember when I actually got my first TV staffing job in LA, you know, and you start taking meetings with, with uh, different agents and different managers, about possibly repping you because I actually didn't have a manager or an agent to get my first job, a story I'll share later. But one of them said, you know, looking at your bio, you, you seem like an interesting and talented person, but you're clearly very unfocused. You really need to focus <laughs> on one thing and focus on doing that well and, and cut loose this other stuff. Needless to say, that person is not my rep. And I think that I've proven them wrong, that, that, that you can do lots of different things if you're really committed to them and committed to trying to do them well. Yeah, I, I, think, I, think, that, I think that's certainly true. It's certainly been in, in my true in my experience in my career as well. And I also think that um, you can't afford to just have one, you know, one card trick anymore, honestly. You know, it's rough out there. You, you know, transmedia is the thing you have to be able to, to I think, talk about you know, be platform agnostic and talk about just well, how's the best way to tell a story, right? I think this is uh, what's really being required of all of us. And I think as content um, increases, it's, uh, it's em emphasis on changing the needle in, in terms of social change, which I think is ever more important. I think that becomes, you know, even, even more true. Well, one of my quotes to live by Marie Wilson, who um, is a uh, a very prominent feminist activist helped create Take Your Daughter to Work Day. And Marie was a men is a mentor of mine. And one of her favorite quotes, which I believe comes courtesy of the indigenous chief Loma man killer, is you don't meet people where you are, you meet people where they are. And that's actually why I love working in so many different formats, because the people who are, you know, reading my work in the Daily Beast or The Guardian are not the same people who are seeing my work on Being Mary Jane or Black Lightning. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been fascinating the different types of letters I get from people depending on where they sort of find my writing. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons I, I love the idea of continuing to work in different formats because you need to meet people where they are and people are in different places. Yeah, I, I think that's very well observed. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about sort of your path right after school. I mean, you know, you've worked in theater and film and TV. So can you talk a little bit about what that trajectory was like and, you know, how did you, how did you get your start in all of those things? Oh 
gosh. So I'm trying to give you the reader's digest version. <laughs> um, so I, you know, I mentioned that I did political science and theater. And what was interesting is I was genuinely interested in both the arts and entertainment and also politics, because uh, that's something that my father was very passionate about. And so I was raised with a very strong sense of social justice, social change, and being part of uh, the world's solutions, you know, instead of just sitting back and criticizing the problems. So I remember I saw the movie, The American President, and there was a, 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 a bit where I thought, okay, I think I want to be Michael J. Fox and be a speechwriter for the president. I think that's what I might want to try. <laughs> And then I also loved acting. I was a very proud drama nerd in high school. I say that with total pride and affection. And so that's why I wanted to study both. And I remember I asked my mom, well, how do I pick a career? And she said, I think it'll be kind of chosen for you. you just, mm -hmm. just do what you do and work hard and it'll kind of reveal itself. And that actually ended up happening. And so I am told this never happens to anybody, but it happened to me. Yes. Um, I graduated from Gallatin and I went to the career services office at NYU I slotted my resume into the different slots for the things I was interested in, which was arts and entertainment and also politics. And I actually got a call from a congressional office oh. and made it through the interviews and they hired me. So I became, you know, the lowest of the low congressional aides district office in New York. And, and so I was, I was on the political track and a couple of things happened. The first thing is a quote someone once gave me in a job was, if you don't want your boss's job, rethink your career, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you're sitting somewhere and you're not going, oh my gosh, this is where I meant to be and I want to have his job or her job, then maybe you're not in the right place. And once I started actually working on different campaigns and working for elected officials, I looked around and I thought, I don't think that I actually do want to be someone who's on campaigns in my 40s and 50s. I don't actually think that's the dream and path I see for myself. And around the same time, something interesting was happening, which is a number of African Americans in my age cohort were that I was friendly with were telling me that they weren't Democrats, they were registered independents. Um, I'm you know, African American and I'm from Texas and I frankly never met black Republicans or independents. I'd only known Democrats. Um, <laughs> Ironically, once I moved to the East Village of New York, I realized that being raised a Democrat in Texas essentially made me like a Republican in New York, but that's a different <laughs> And I would say that it's helped shape my politics because I would kind of call myself someone who's a little bit suspicious of everybody, right? Um, which has helped with my writing uh, covering politics, I would say. But um, I know we'll get to that in a second. But the point I'm making is I was meeting all of these uh, registered independents who were African-Americans. And at the time, you know, I'd been working in politics and I felt, well, this could actually really shake things up, right? If you have people who, you know, who are not like my parents' generation, who have so loyally kind of carried the Democratic Party, there's a story there mm -hmm. and that's a story that should be told. And so one of my closest friends, who's still one of my closest friends to this day, and he also went to NYU, my best friend, David, um, he literally had a birthday party and he worked in entertainment, uh, entry level. But he worked in entertainment as an assistant. And he said to me, listen, I'm having this party. Um, and when I walked into the party, he said, I'm sitting you next to Dan. He's a literary agent. You should tell him about your book. And I went, what book are we talking about? <laughs> Not familiar with this book. And he said, well, Kelly, you've been talking nonstop about, because I do talk a lot, as people can tell, you've been talking nonstop about this trend happening in African-American politics. So just, you should tell him, I mean, you, you said someone should write about this. I said, someone, I'm not a writer. And he said, well, just, he's a great guy, just tell him. So I sit next to him at this dinner and I was thinking, oh, I don't wanna be one of those people in New York who, you know, corner someone at a party. Cause I'm sure that happens to you and it's happened to me, right? When, once you're in the industry, everyone has an idea, right? I have a script for you. So I didn't wanna be that person, but he and I had been chatting for about 30 minutes or so. And finally I said, Dan, I got to confess, David had an ulterior motive seating us next to one another. He thought you might be interested in my book idea. And um, he, I saw his eyes kind of do the thing where you're polite, but you're like, oh gosh. Here we go. Said, well, what's, what's the idea, Kelly? So I start doing what I'm doing here, which is going a million miles a minute and talking about these trends and the people I'd met and my experience in politics and how I did feel that certain um, older Democrats were a bit out of touch with what was happening with younger voters of color. And he's letting me go on and on. And I see him trying to get a word in. And I'm like, one more thing, just one more thing. And <laughs> finally, Dan looks at me and says, Kelly, I only handle fiction and not. 
to this poor man I had cornered. And then he looks at me and he says, well, who have you sent your proposal to? And I said, what do you mean? What's a proposal? <laughs> and he goes, okay, well, how many chapters have you written? I said, well, it's more like up here. And he said, well, you know, there's a book called How to Write a Book Proposal. I encourage you to purchase it. It'll help you get started. Good luck. Yeah. I turned around and started talking to someone else. And I felt like the world's biggest loser. And, you know, like a John Hughes movie where you want to crawl under the table in the cafeteria in high school. And a couple weeks went by and I got a package in the mail and I opened it. And it was titled, it was the book, How to Write a Book Proposal. Oh. He wrote me a note and said, dear Kelly, I hope this helps you get started. And so this is where a bit of the Texas comes in. I sent him cookies to thank him. You know, and I said, look, if you can make the effort to send me this lovely, encouraging book, I'm going to make an effort at a, give the old college try of writing a book proposal. And a couple days went by and I got an email that said, dear Kelly, thank you for the cookies. See below. And he had forwarded an email to his colleague who handled nonfiction political books and said, I met this woman at a party. This is what she said. I know nothing about the topic, passing it on. And I wrote a reply and he said, talk to her yourself. She's great. And I started an email exchange that went back and forth. And that woman's name was Michelle Rubin. Uh, she was an agent at Writer's House and she represented the Martin Luther King Literary State and a bunch of other major civil rights and political books. And I went to meet with her and it was one of those like in a movie in terms of when you find a creative soulmate. Michelle and I hit it off. We talked for three hours. And at the end of the conversation, I said, well, what happens next? She said, go home and start writing. And she represented me. And I followed how to write a book proposal, the book. And I finished my proposal. She sent it out Thanksgiving. I remember because it was the holiday season. And I was leaving to go see my grandparents who lived in rural, rural Oklahoma. So in the middle of nowhere, my cell phone didn't even work. And as I was leaving for the airport, she called and said, um, we have an offer on the book. I told them you're going on vacation and you're unreachable, but have a great holiday. And part of why we had an offer on the book is because someone by the name of Barack Obama had decided to run for president. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, my little tiny book about the changing attitudes of African-American younger voters, all of a sudden seemed a little bit more relevant. Mm -hmm. And then the book came out the week he won Iowa. That is how I became a writer. So I think the moral of that story is always send cookies. Yes. Right. If I'm going to distill it down, it's just always send cookies. I think that's I, I've learned something here. Well, and always say thank you, right? Because that's the truth. I'm joking, of course, but yes. No, no, no. But yes. you, you, in all seriousness, I actually do think that's the most important part of this. Oh, story. I do too. I was making a joke, but I do. I think being, you know, when someone extends themselves like that towards you, um, you know, it, 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 or even in a lesser way, you know, it's just very important to be grateful and thankful and, and yeah. pay it forward as well. And you've had a very successful career as a producer. And I have to tell you, I, now that I'm on the other side, I'm always shocked when you do things for people that you don't have to, yeah. <laughs> to try to help them in the industry yeah, and yeah. never hear from them again. And not only do you sometimes never hear a thank you, they didn't even follow through, right? Oh, they, that drives me insane, frankly. <laughs> right? They say, can you introduce me to this person I've been trying? And you say, okay, well, I'm going to do the intro. And then you find out they never followed up right. and you're thinking, what and so I always or didn't let you know what happened, which is another offense, right? And, like, and I, and I, in all seriousness, I feel like for the people who are listening, so many people think it's just about the talent and they go, I don't understand. I wrote a great script, I wrote a great book. Why am I not getting where I want to? And I always encourage people to really think about how they treat other people mm -hmm. because you know. <sighs> Talent will only get you so far. At a certain point, it's, you know, who's a kind person? Who do I like working with? And, and I think I culture is changing somewhat. I mean, I think there used to be a culture in Hollywood that allowed for the, you know, cigar chomping, right. ashtray throwing jerk. And, and I, you know, I, the people that I work with, you know, I eschew them and, you know, I hope everyone else does too. I, I just don't think that, that we can tolerate that culture anymore. You know, it comes from a lot of, you know, racist, misogynist, patriarchal, 
thinking that has to be upended anyway. Um, so we might as well just throw out this bad behavior along with the rest it's of bad, it. It's bad, it's toxic, and it also doesn't result in better art. I, I know a lot of really talented, nice people. And right. so this myth of the evil, mean genius who throws things is totally absurd. Yeah, I agree completely. I think, you know, and there are plenty of talented people who want to be collaborative and, and smart and kind and sparky and friendly and not right. waste your time with all the drama, which none of us need. We have enough drama. We don't need totally. any more, right? Totally. <laughs> but speaking of drama, look at that segue I found. I'm so proud of myself. Fabulous. You have a play opening that opened this week, um, The Glorious World of Crowns, Kinks, and Curls, directed by Bianca Laverne Jones at the Center Stage Theater in Baltimore. And, um, you know, I read through the synopsis and it really made me, I'm going to go see it now virtually. I'm going to buy a ticket. Um, but uh, the play looks at many aspects of race and culture through the lens of women and their uneasy relationship with their bodies. and even more specifically their hair. And, um, you know, I was quite moved even just reading through the synopsis, honestly, because I do feel that every woman I know is in an uneasy re relationship with herself and her hair. Yeah. Um, and so I wanted to have you walk us through, if you could, the play's inception and its evolution to the stage. Yeah, so I, I mentioned being a, a drama nerd in high school, which I'm very proud of. I was even in the Texas Despian Society. So um, I love doing plays and stuff in high school. So um, this is such a dream come true. You know, I'm doing all sorts of other fun things in my career, but this really does feel like a dream come true. And because there's something about theater and the communal experience, even when it's online, the, the emails I've been getting from people about the play have been really moving, but the Genesis is, as you pointed out, I've had about nine lives in my career. And I, you know, I, the book really um, launched me as a journalist. The book came out the week that uh, President Obama won the Iowa caucus. And I was on cable news a lot, even though really my career was writing, right? I was a journalist, but mm -hmm. everyone knows there's the, the kind of cable news industrial complex. So I yeah. was a journalist. <laughs> was a whole other hour of that conversation, right? That's a whole other thing, yeah. <laughs> a whole other thing. And uh, what I think I wasn't prepared for is how much of my writing career would revolve around my appearance. And so just to put this in context about kind of who I am outside of that career, I had to be taught how to do my own makeup once I started appearing on cable news, because I was not someone who wore makeup regularly. So it was to go from being like, great, I just write articles, right? to, okay, what's going on with your hair? What's going on with your makeup today? We can't put you on air looking like that. And so much of my life became about that. And there was a real turning point for me where I had um, my broadcast TV agent called and said the call that every person who's you know waiting to be discovered and become a star waits for, which is one of the most powerful people in the news business just called us. They've been following your career and they wanna meet. And I did the whole happy dance that you do, which is like, this is, the, this is the moment you've been waiting for. And then she says, great, he had a cancellation tomorrow morning, 9 a.m. He'll see you in his office there. What my broadcast agent did not know is I had taken out my hair extensions and not told her. Which for people who don't understand, if you're an actor or an on-air personality, you're not supposed to significantly change your appearance without discussing that with your representatives. And the reason I didn't discuss it is because I wasn't expecting to have the most important meeting of my career. Um, I was going to be off air for a few days, so it was supposed to be fine. So it turned into this sort of comedy of errors because I was trying to figure out how does one, right? He's expecting a certain image of myself that he just saw on television probably 48 hours ago. And that's not what I'm going to look like in walking into his office. So, you know, it was sort of a turning point because the meeting went fine and he asked me questions about my career. He wasn't like, you know, oh my God, which is what had happened in my head but I'd spent so much mental energy preparing for this meeting where I should have been focused on what's going on in the news, what's happening in politics, thinking mm -hmm. about, oh my God, my hair, my hair, my hair. And I knew I didn't want to live that way. And that was a turning point because I started slowly kind of easing out where I slowly stopped wearing the extensions on air. People would say things about it, even viewers. And I just didn't want to be beholden to that. And then what happened, which is connected to the previous question you asked me, is I was already becoming a bit disillusioned with what I call the Twitterfication of news. Um, I never wanted my tombstone to read, she fought a lot with people on Twitter, she <laughs> fought a lot with people on cable news. I felt that perhaps there was a bigger purpose and there was more to life than that. 
And even my most amazing editors, you would hear them say things like, well, can't you, you know, let's get a little something going, right? And you're thinking, but that's not, I, I just want to tell stories. So i had gone to the public theater and I'm connecting this back to the play. I'd gone to the public theater to see um, a fabulous play called The Good Negro, which was written by the amazing Tracy Scott Wilson, who is, who's writing the new Aretha Franklin film, become very famous in her own right, wrote for the Americans. And the play was life-changing because it was basically telling a fictionalized version of the struggles of what it was like to be a Martin Luther King type character. And I fell in love with the play. And, it, I, and after I seen that play with my mother when she was visiting New York that, that week, I said, that's the kind of writing I wanna be able to do, you know, to tell stories in a nuanced way where you can have empathy for people you don't agree with and not just pounce on Twitter. So I secretly applied for the Public Theater's Emerging Writers Group Fellowship. I didn't even tell my family. The one of the editors who was my reference, I said, I need you to be a reference. And if I don't get it, we are never discussing that this happened. You were to pretend I never asked you for this. And couldn't believe it when I was one of the 10 picked and it changed my life because I rediscovered my love of writing. And I realized that the path forward for me was really to try to raise complicated, nuanced issues, but in a format with fictional characters where you could really have some of the conversations you can't have in the news. Mm -hmm. And once I got the fellowship about 18 months into it, um, believe it or not, I got a phone call from Mara Braca Keel, yeah. who is one of the most successful African-American female showrunners in history, a mentor of mine. And uh, I only knew her socially. She liked having journalists do pop-ups on Being Mary Jane. So I had a 15 second and you'll miss a cameo. And Mara called and said, look, you know, we've been fans of your work and We'd love to try to see if we can convince you to join us here in LA. Um, but the catch is you'd have to move in like two weeks. And that was my <laughs> first staff writing job. And so I see it as all connected, right? That I was becoming sort of disillusioned with where media was headed. I was really becoming disillusioned with the idea that to tell stories, I had to worry about what I looked like all the time. Mm -hmm. And so Mara really gave me this extraordinary lifeline that I got to go work on a TV show writing scripts about an African-American female cable news journalist. Right. And I got to start writing plays. Yeah. And so now here we are, what is it, six years later, and the genesis of this play about the stories of Black women and what we endure in the workplace and in our personal lives when it comes to our hair all started from that whole experience with me on cable news. So I have no regrets about that. Mm -hmm. Gosh, I'm so happy that the only times I have to put makeup on are when I do conversations like this. Like, <laughs> you could have come makeup free. We're casual here. We don't like to put any pressure on, but um, okay. <laughs> I mean, I, I agree with you. I think that uh, pop culture um, is a really strong way of influencing the narrative. It, it's something that I try to do in my own writing. And I, I wonder, are there um, particular instances that you can point to um, besides uh, the Good Negro? Are there other instances that you can point to? Are there other media that you feel have changed the dialogue or, or, or have pushed the conversation in one direction or another? Sure. I mean, I was so proud of working on Black Lightning, which I found out was one of the late, great John Lewis's favorite shows, which mm -hmm. I've always said since learning that, that, you know, even if I win an Oscar, I don't think I'll be able to make my mother prouder than her knowing that John Lewis actually watched something that I wrote for. <laughs> um, but I will tell you that Black Panther, I mean, the day that a group of African-American friends and I went to see Black Panther, we came out of the theater and we went to grab coffee to talk about the film. And there was a little boy who was white who was wearing a Black Panther costume. And I thought, okay, this is changing culture. That's cool. Yeah. There's so many, so things like that. Obviously, I realize his legacy is extremely complicated because of the terrible things he did. But I would say that, you know, I've never forgotten that Karl Rove said that there would have been no election of President Barack Obama without the Cosby show. And so mm -hmm. that has always mm -hmm. been um, a, a real example for me in terms of some of the work I want to do, mm -hmm. because it means you don't always have to highlight socio-political issues to make a political difference through your art. Yes. Um, sometimes you can just tell stories about people and allow others to see their humanity and that makes a difference. And so a I lot of that's actually probably a more effective way, honestly, because I think that, you know, 
people have to be in the mood for a polemic or a history lesson, right. or right, or something that feels like, oh, this is going to educate me, right? Where I believe in like the stealth approach, you sneak in some entertainment, and with that, you know, with, with that, you sneak in a little bit of uh, a little messaging, a little. How that happen? I learned something. I didn't mean to learn something today. How did that happen? You plan on that? Look how that happened. <laughs> The stealth, all about that. Um, so what was it like to mount a production in the middle of the pandemic? And I, I'm also curious about um, the discussion uh, that led to running the play as a, as a streamer. I know that very early in the pandemic, we hosted an event sort of on snapshots on the entertainment industry. And we looked at a lot of different industries. And one of the, the person who spoke on behalf of theater said something very interesting. Um, and again, this is very early in the pandemic. So back last May, um, he said he thought that the business model for traditional theater was kind of dependent on bussing in the gray hairs, right, from the suburbs. And that if that disappeared, he thought the whole business model for theater might change, which might lead to more exciting and different kinds of production. Which, you know, and I'm paraphrasing, obviously, but I was very taken by that. And I thought, you know, the problem with theater, and I also began my career in theater at the Schubert organization was my wow. first job. But I, I, I think, that, you know, there's always been a, a price barrier, right? Yeah. There's always been, you know, there's always been a sort of a price barrier and a location barrier, right? right. New York was the center. And well, obviously, there are good theaters elsewhere. But that was, you know, Broadway in the heart. And then I'll so the prices were so hard, high. So I'm wondering, do you think there's a future in which you have a live performance and also a streamed performance that allows people to have access that might not always be able to for a reduced market price? What do you think about that? Where do you think that uh, this might take us with theater? Well, I defer to the people who know much more than I do about <laughs> that, including Marcia Pendleton, who's been working with us on this play. And um, for those who don't know, Marcy is a bit of a New York legend because I, you know, she is in the same way that I would call them, what do they call them? Oscar whispers, yeah. Oscar campaigns. Uh, Marcia really is that, I believe, and I mean this in the, in the utmost compliment um, in terms of black audiences. No one knows more about diverse audiences in the American theater than Marcia Pendleton. And she's been working with us on this show and her prediction is, is that it will be a bit of an, a, um, a, a combination approach, that that's where we will be left to your point. Because in addition to the price, the geographic barriers, which have been huge, huge, huge. So speaking for this play, the, my answer three weeks ago, right before we opened, if you'd said, what does this experience would have been like? I would have said, a total nightmare. Right? <laughs> Working on a TV show full-time during the day on the West Coast, while also mounting my first production in a, that was filmed live in a theater just without an audience. So it was rehearsing, everything was live that was happening that I was supposed to, and I was on Zoom at the same time on the East Coast, nightmare, don't recommend it. However, so proud of this production and so proud of the audiences we've been able to bring in. Mm -hmm. And to your point, on Sunday, there was one group, just one group had bought over 40 tickets. Mm -hmm. And I was doing a talk back just with that group. Right. And women from all over the country. Right. Women from all over the country. And I thought, this is so extraordinary that people who were not even here were able to watch, were not even in Baltimore. And I'm mm -hmm. in Los Angeles, and we're all getting to have a conversation about this play. Yes, please, more of this, right? This what I call the Zoom lemonade, these types of. I mean, or the, I'm sorry, the COVID lemonades. I'm mis misquoting my own self here. But yeah, the COVID, this is what I call the COVID lemonade is realizing like by mounting a play like this, we realize that different impact it can have, that reach can be so much broader, right? I, I, I think that's really something we should continue to think about. I think it's exceptional. I certainly hope so. And I will tell you the other way that it, the, the more COVID lemonade, if you will, yes. is in writer's rooms. I've been on different TV shows since COVID started. And I got to tell you, there are people in our writers' rooms who are not in New York and not in LA. Mm -hmm. That's not happening if someone's got to move cross country to go sit physically in a space. Right. And it's diversifying writers' rooms in terms I'm, of yeah. class, and that is super important. And I don't I want to just in terms of perspective, because you know Hollywood can become a thought bubble, you know, with repetition and having people who are living in a different geographic place having different experiences. I I really think it helps the you know, the diversity in all senses, right, um, within the room. Um, so, uh, okay, so you work uh, 
boss on multiple platforms and media, as we've well established, you true gal. Very tired. Um, so I want to know how do you um, spin all those plates and badly. Is, is what did they say? <laughs> badly, badly. Yeah. Um, is there a type of project that you like the most? You have, or I mean, it's, it sounds to me like theater might be your your passionate love. Is that true, or do you do you love all your projects equally, like any good creator? How do you feel? Um, like any good parent, I tell them I do. Because <laughs> I feel like, how can you finish them if you're not saying, I love you, I love, I you. love you so much. Um, uh, theater, I would say, is the thing I'm most passionate about. You know, as, as my manager says, it's the thing you did when you were a kid, right? So it's the, it's the dream. But I will tell you, I really do believe that the, that the Marie Wilson, Wilma Mankiller quote, those are the words I live by. So I will tell you that as an example, um, I was guest hosting left, right, and center for the NPR affiliate in LA the week that Mr. Floyd was killed, that George Floyd was killed. And this actually was not some divine plan, but I was guest hosting and every guest we interviewed that week was that, for that show was black. Mm -hmm. And the conversation we had, people from different backgrounds, different political persuasions, different ages, that we had about race, the, the emails I got from people were so extraordinary mm -hmm. about what they learned in that conversation that I felt like, okay, this is right where I need to be this week. You know, like this was a different form of storytelling. Um, and so that's why I really do have this, you got to meet people where they are. There were people who needed to hear that conversation between all of us. And so I was very grateful for that and very grateful in that moment to have the kind of career where I could go from, a, I was working in a writer's room mm -hmm. and I went and guest hosted this show mm -hmm. and they were just two very different ways of, of telling stories in the world. And I felt both were meaningful, just different, you know? Yeah, of course, yeah. Um, so, uh, okay, so you're a Texas girl, right? I am. Rural, rural Texas, where did you grow up? I grew up in a suburb of Houston, so Fort Bend County, Missouri City, Sugar Land area for anyone who know actually knows Texas. Right. Still very much eat like a Texan. I had catfish and fried okra this weekend. Although you talk like a New Yorker, like me, like you're like I rarely run into people who talk as fast as I do, but I think you're in competition. So where, where <laughs> is your spiritual home? Is it New York, LA, Texas? Where do you feel most like yourself? You know, I've been based in New York so long that I, I think they say what it's over 10 years and then you can sort of claim it. Mm. But I have to tell you, because of COVID, I've spent, you know, most of the last year in LA. Mm. So I really, you know, have become fully bi-coastal. I've been doing really the bi-coastal thing a few months here, a few months there. And then you know, COVID happened. Um, I think that's the way to go, bi-coastal. I mean, these both cities are great. So yeah. Um, where, do you think that, I mean, you talked a little bit about this before, about coming to New York and realizing that, you know, as a, a Texas Republican, I mean, Texas, a Democrat, you were almost a Republican, Republican, which made me laugh because my parents were also political. My father was uh, involved in New York City politics when oh, I was wow. growing up. And, um, you know, uh, but I, I, th I wondered, uh, did, did it, what was else, what else did you find about really shaped you about that Texas perspective on the world? And where, how do you think, what do you think that brings to your work that growing up in Texas. I think it's the biggest gift ever because I grew up in Texas and I would say I was the first generation in my family that was solidly middle class. Um, my mother, my father grew up on a farm in rural, rural Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. My mother um, grew up chopping cotton as a small child in rural Oklahoma. Her whole family, they picked cotton in the hot sun um, for many years. And so um, having people with that kind of perspective, I think is invaluable. And frankly, I would argue that that was more important when I was working as a political columnist than me moving to Washington, which I never did. Mm -hmm. And I actually think it served me well because um, I am someone who's not only having conversations with people in New York and LA. Um, and I know a lot of us get sensitive on the coast about people from other places saying we're not real America or what have you. And that's obviously not true. We are real Americans, but um, it becomes very easy to sort of live in a bubble where you're only discussing issues with people who think like you right. um, or who live like you. And one of the things that I think really helped me as a political columnist was the fact that I still have the same best friend from high school who lives in Texas. 
and is right now primarily a stay-at-home mom. Um, you know, my mother still lives in Texas. The one of the big examples I give of this, of, of the downside of only socializing with people in New York and LA or your bubbles, you know, your cliques in DC, is it's part of why no one thought Joe Biden would win the nomination, right? Because that became the consensus of the chattering classes in the newsrooms, particularly in New York and DC. And a lot of the newsrooms skew younger, they skew whiter, and they skew Ivy or, you know, similar to Ivy's like NYU. Um, and meanwhile, I was talking to my mother and my mother and her friends and her peers were unmovable, immovable in their support. And I thought, well, it's going to be interesting to see what happens in South Carolina. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people like my mom in South Carolina, and we saw what happened in South Carolina. So that's why I actually believe it's, it's been the greatest gift um, to have grown up there and to also have those relationships, but to also have had my um, life very much changed by the people I've befriended in New York and LA who are different from the people in Texas. So I feel like I have kind of a bicultural approach to coverage, including my documentary, Reversing Row. I mean, that's where it came from. Mm -hmm. I don't vilify um, people who don't see eye to eye with me on reproductive rights. I want to hear them and I want to learn. And that was where that film came from, you know, is that perspective of let's, let's talk because you, you sound like someone I grew up with. So let's have a conversation, you know? Yeah, I've always believed that, you know, if you can find one thing to agree on, then then you can find other things to agree on, right? But the problem is that that one thing, you know, we get we get polarized off one thing that we know we don't agree on and we stop the conversation. Especially now. I mean, the, the column I threatened to write for years and it got away from me, as I said to my editors, there would have been a great column titled How Twitter Would Have Killed the Civil Rights Act. Mm. Because I think of like all of the secret conversations that people like Martin Luther King were having with President Johnson. You know, mm -hmm. and today someone would have been like, here's the purity test for Martin Luther King. He's not allowed to speak to President Johnson until President Johnson says this in public, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, and yeah, you can't yeah. move forward that way. So yeah. yeah. No, I totally agree with that. And also we should abolish purity tests as well as cancellation culture. There, you know, we got a lot of work to do, all of us, but we'll <laughs> You know, with good intentions, we'll get there. I believe that. So, on on a lighter note, um, what have been your delights of the pandemic? Have, and since you're in LA, have you discovered any new favorite restaurants besides uh, any fa favorite things to watch, listen, read? What's been keeping you entertained during the pandemic? Oh, that's a great question. Well, I would tell you, you know, it's been a very strange year because I have so much empathy um, and compassion for people who had such a tough time. Um, for those of us who are a little bit, as much as I talk, it's hard for people to believe this, but I am actually fairly introverted in my private life. I really <laughs> love quiet of reading, you know, and having the freedom and the time to do that. And normally I have a life that's so on the go in terms of travel and moving from one coast to the next. I actually don't get as much quiet time to just write mm -hmm. and think as I would like. So in a weird way, I think my reps would say, this has been, they, they've in some ways been relieved that, oh God, she's home and she's writing. She's not <laughs> out at an event. She's not doing an interview. She's just home writing. And what a blessing that is. Are they going to come after us for this? Or are they going to say we took Possibly. you away and, you know, hunt us down? <laughs> yeah. So, no, I've gotten so much writing done. I really have. I've gotten a lot of writing done, which has been a gift. Um, I've been, you know, watching reruns of favorites like the golden girls because that always makes me smile and i also mm -hmm. think especially now as a writer myself and writing on the sex in the city reboot i do consider golden girls one of the greatest shows i mean it's timeless it holds up the way it dealt with sexuality so revisiting shows like that and um and i'm reading uh, a book right now called trio which i think is fairly fabulous and it's um you call it a bio i guess it's a biography written by by aaron saroyan about his mother, mm. uh, Carol Saroyan, Matthau, Gloria Vanderbilt, Una O'Neill, who were all best friends from high school. And it's about their journeys as these sort of extraordinary oh. women at a time where it was tough to be an extraordinary woman. I'm gonna and have to write that down, check that out. That sounds really good. good. All right, thank you. That was a pro tip, I'm excited. Something good to read. Um, so you've succeeded in so many areas. Is there something that you have your eyes set on that you haven't? you know, taken on yet? I mean, astronaut, ro you know, rocket scientist, what, physicist, what, like where, what else are you going to do? I just really want a dog. <laughs> I and think that's an achievable aspiration for a woman of your talents. I do. Grown up, but my mother's, it's the one thing my mother said I'm not allowed to do because <laughs> because of laugh, I had a dog growing up that was left with her when I went off to NYU. 
Mm. And my sister did the same thing when she went off to Rice and my niece did the same thing when she went off to college. So my mother said, I see this, this the, how this movie ends, which is you getting a dog during the pandemic and me taking care of the dog once you start traveling around the world for projects again. Mom just said, no, not, you know, like, you need a little dog that you can take with you and like a little- Yeah, I love how you're thinking. But um, yeah, I actually do have um, a couple of projects in the pipeline, including some narrative podcasts I'm incredibly passionate about because that's a really growing space. Yes. And I will tell you that, you know, I think you, you probably- uh, deduce this, I care deeply about social justice and civil rights. And what I'm finding is you can kind of tell stories that are less commercial mm -hmm. in the narrative podcast space because there's a little bit less money. Right. Economic it. pressure on it. Yeah. That people will take risks. So I have a couple of stories that are set in the past that have to do with race that I'm super excited about. Great. And I have another documentary cooking that I'm not allowed to talk about, but God, I'm so excited about it. You'll tell us first when you, you can talk about it, right? So we can come out and support. Okay. That's all I ask. Okay. Um, so I, I want to just remind our audience that um, we have a few minutes left and if people want to put any questions into the chat, they can do that or into the Q&A and I will relay them to Kelly. Um, what advice would you have? I mean, you know, I, I think what you said at the beginning, which is very true, is that no, there's not always one path and no one's path is the same. Um, but for someone who is listening and aspiring to be, you know, Kelly Goff, um, what, what do you suggest they do? What advice would you give them to take into the world as they plot their next steps? Well, I guess the most important piece of advice is to focus on the work because I meet so many people and we touched upon this a little bit, right? About people we try to help like with introductions or mm -hmm. that sort of thing or feedback on a script. And so many people, I think because of the whole um, social media culture are focused on branding first, work second or work mm -hmm. and I have found that nothing takes the place of a great script. Mm -hmm. Nothing takes the place of a great script. And I will be honest now that I'm in a position where I can help people. If someone says to me, you know, um, oh, I don't have that. I don't have a script, but here's the idea. And I, and I Google you and you have like 25,000 tweets or you've posted a lot of TikToks, but you don't have a great script. That <laughs> tells me where your priorities are. And I'm, it never ceases to amaze me how many people are like that, where they're like, I've got a great Instagram, I've got a this, but I don't have a great script. That is where it's all got to start is you've got to focus on the work and focus on the writing. So that's my, my piece of advice. Mm -hmm. And also I would say that when it comes to social media, I have not hired for my own show, but I know plenty of people who have. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people look at that stuff. So what can seem like a pithy joke to you in 2020, when you're interviewing for a job on a TV show 2021, and you made a pithy joke about a TV show you didn't like, and it happened to be one that the showrunner worked on, probably not getting the job, right? So was it worth it to do that pithy tweet when it's going to be around forever? So, so things like that, I just encourage people to really think about. So we have a question, a related question uh, from the audience. This is from uh, Lizette Terry Gallatin, uh, 2020. And she says, how do you know when you've reached a place where your script is ready to be pitched? Which, you know, is a really tough question, I oh, think, to answer. I don't know if you have an answer to that. That's a, a good question, but a hard one. Oh my gosh, it's so hard. Um, yeah, because I have scripts that I'm like, I oh, still need some work. I have a play that's on stage right now and I'm like, oh, these are the 12 things I plan to change as soon as the play. <laughs> so here's what I would say is find people you trust to give you honest feedback and, and help them guide you and then listen to your gut. So what I mean by that is you don't need a famous person to read your script. You need someone you trust. So for instance, one of the people who I have read my scripts when I have any questions about, is it ready? is uh, my friend Kevin R.T., who was in the Emerging Writers Group at the Public Theater with me. He's not a showrunner, but he's a great writer and he gets my voice. And so when Kevin says, what were you trying to say with this scene? And I go, well, I'm trying to say this. He's like, okay, I didn't get that. Mm -hmm. So then I want to go back to that scene. But if you fix that scene, I think you're golden. I, I believe it when he says it, right? So you need to find those people. And it could just be a friend who's also trying to make it as a writer. Yeah. I didn't do this, but I know other people, or actually I did this briefly. I did it for a few months is a writer's group, you know, where you hold each other accountable. Mm -hmm. I, that works for a lot of people too. So I would just find your people. That's what it is about this business. Find your people that you trust and then, you know, go to them. 
Yeah. And, and I, you know, I would just say that I agree with you. I don't think any writer gets to a point where they say this is done. You know, someone says that's all the time you have. Same right. with editing. You'd never stop editing unless someone says, that's it. We're shutting the editing room down, right? No right. more time, no more right. money for you, right? So it's, uh, right. Um, we have another uh, question for Maureen Zufak. Uh, she's Steinhardt class of 2023. Um, she says, oftentimes things like book writing, journalism, theater, et cetera, are seen as existing in separate spheres. Uh -huh. How does one navigate being a jack of all writing trades? Essentially, she's asking, how do I become you? So only you can answer that. So I turn that over. <laughs> um, I, you know, I wish I had a good answer. I'm going to give a shout out to someone who doesn't get enough credit. My assistant, mm -hmm. Ashley, is fabulous and she keeps me on track. And I actually genuinely don't believe I would have gone through the last couple months of working on a TV show full time and a play almost full time without her help. Mm -hmm. um, because she really does keep me with in terms of scheduling. And that's something I struggle with. And by the way, it's part of how I ended up at Gallatin, right? Those of us who are not sort of traditional nine to five personalities look for opportunities to kind of be like, I'll do this at noon, I'll do this at five, I'll do this <laughs> at 2 a.m., you know? Um, but the other thing I would say is you got to start with doing one thing well, right? Because then people will trust you. And so what I found is the person who said to me six years ago, you know, you got some talent, Kelly, but you just do too many things. Once I actually completed the documentary film I was working on and it did well and it, you know, it had an impact, it's hard to say I was just kind of being a dilettante, right? I, I focused on that and I did that well, but that also meant that there were things I had to turn down while working on that film. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. for the record, I just want to be very clear. I don't recommend doing what I've done the last couple of months of trying to do both. Yeah. I got through it. But, you know, I do wonder what it would have been like to just do this play, but I'm also having such an amazing time on this show that I, I had to make it work. But I would say if you can just really focus on doing one really great thing well at a time, that's important. And the, the last thing I'd say about that is you can also, um, while you're working on one thing, be developing another. That, that I think is also a big part of our business is being nimble enough to say, mm -hmm. I'm on a great TV series. It might not last forever. Most don't. Yes. Let me work on a script or a thing for after this, you know. Right. right. I think that's always good advice. I think everyone should always have multiple things uh, in going on, just uh, particularly in, in, you know, just for to keep a lively mind, but also in this business, putting your uh, faith in one thing happening or one thing continuing is, you know, a fool's game. By the way, can I just say too, I would also add though, specifically for women and people of color, it gives you, it empowers you. One of the things I've learned, especially in Hollywood, is there is a lot of, uh, there are a lot of people who I see who someone gets, uh, when people feel like they know you feel like you don't have other options, it's easier for them to, to not treat you with the respect and dignity you deserve, right? Mm, that's interesting. But when someone feels like, oh, I know that they're just a full-time TV writer and they don't have another job lined up. I don't have to pay them what they say they're worth. Mm -hmm. Whereas I have had this happen where I have said to my reps before, that's okay. I don't need it. I'd rather go work on my documentary. And if they want to come back with a better offer, they'll give us a call, you know, and that's something I, I'm, I'm happy to have that as part of, you know. Yeah. Um, I have a question um, from, uh, well, I, I totally agree with that. The, the idea of the, being able to walk away. I've, I've, is a, I learned this early on in negotiations that that is the only true power in a negotiation is being really able to say, right, walk away from this deal. Right. Um, so Noro, who is one of our favorite alums, uh, uh, says, thanks for the discussion. Ray, the playwriting, what was your process like? Did you workshop the piece with actors, write alone, um, et cetera? And Noro, I should add, who I know a little bit is also um, a wonderful writer. Oh, Noro. That is such a great question. And I'm so happy you asked it. I'm almost wondering if one of my friends planted you to ask that question. <laughs> because um, as a playwright, especially after the program at the public, I had a few readings and you know they didn't get produced, right? And then I wrote this play, finished the first draft a year ago. And here we are a year later with the production. Mm -hmm. And during this process, there were moments where I said to myself, now I understand why they do all the readings because there were moments where I thought, I really wish I had more time, right? Like if I had more time, I would experiment. I would 
change this. I would change that. Mm -hmm. And we just didn't have the luxury of that time. So the answer to your question is it literally was a year from me completing a first draft to a production, which I know almost never happens. And what a gift that's been to me. Mm -hmm. But I also just want to say to every person listening, who's been like, I can't get something produced. I'm in production and workshop hell that time is, is often a luxury. And so enjoy it when you have it. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's, yeah. So that's the answer to that question. Okay. Um, we have another question. This is from uh, Danielle uh, from Gallatin. She's saying, um, this conversation has been so inspiring. So that's good oh, to hear. Yeah. Um, I'd love to know what advice you might share for the class of 2021, the most recent alums joining the Gallatin Network. How can they spin the COVID graduation feeling? That's so sad. Um, into a more empowering opportunity. I think that's a lovely question. I think, you know, I mean, I've been saying to a lot of students, everyone has a, a, a story about what this year was for yeah. them. And you have to make that part of your narrative the same way any other experience that you've had becomes part of your narr narrative. But what what advice would you give to the, the new I, I love this question too. And what I would say is I'm now older, I'm so much older than all of you now at this point, but now I can say this um, with confidence in a way I could not have 10 years ago, which is turn anything that you see as your liability into your superpower. And what I mean by that is, especially when I was graduating and I was trying to make it in media. And then later I was trying to make it in Hollywood. I, to be blunt, you know, I'm not someone who grew up in privilege and so um, more privileged than my parents did, but I, you know, I'm certainly not from wealth. I went to NYU on financial aid and scholarships. And when I was trying to make it in media in New York, I remember that feeling when I would see people whose parents had bought them apartments, who literally they could take a media job or not. It didn't affect if they could pay their rent. And I was struggling so much. And that was a really tough feeling. And I thought, maybe is this journey really for, for me? Like, can mm -hmm. I make it? And now all these years later, I realized that that has become my superpower mm -hmm. because I know what I can endure. Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting because I know some people who grew up in extreme privilege who also have that, you know, right? That sort of what I call the hustler instinct uh, that's so necessary in really competitive professions. But I also know people who don't have it, right? Because they didn't have to really endure as much as people like me did when they were mm -hmm. coming up. So when they come across an obstacle in their career, they really don't know how to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Whereas for me, I channel Kamala Harris, I eat nose for breakfast. My <laughs> response when a studio exec says no is, oh, too bad for them, they're gonna miss out. Right? Let me go to their competitor next door and I'll pitch them because someone's going to be smart enough to buy my idea. And so I encourage all of you who've had a tough year is to look for what that has gifted you in terms of your superpower. Has it made you more tenacious? Has it made you more resilient? And that's what the story you should be telling in interviews is, oh, you know, I had a really tough year, had to move home with my parents, but I helped them with this. I helped them with that. And this is what it reminded me. And that's why I'm sitting here interviewing for this job right now. That is, a, I think, a very inspiring place to end. I, I feel like that was a very uplifting uh, piece of advice and um, and uh, really a pleasure talking with you. I, I think uh, it's been really exciting to hear about all the different things you're working on and um, you know, very excited to see what you do with uh, the S SATC uh, reboot. That'll be fascinating. And um, everyone will check out Glorious World of Crowns, Kinks, and Yes, Curls. please, everyone. Again, the Glorious World of Crowns, Kinks, and Curls at the Baltimore Center Stage. You can Google it by virtual tickets. I can tell you, as I said before, just even by the synopsis, I got a little teary. So it's on my plans uh, for the weekend, and I hope you'll make it yours as well. This was so um, fun. I loved Gallatin, and it, it you know, it's, it's meant so much in my life. So this has been such a pleasure. And I'm sorry it was a few minutes late. No worries. And I will tell you that um, Gallatin loves you because when I went to Gallatin, I said, we'd like to fe fe feature a Gallatin alum for this uh, spotlight series that we've started. You were the first name that came up. Oh, so thank you. the love is mutual. And thank you again for your time and all your wisdom, Kelly. It was really a pleasure. I, a can pleasure. I really admire your career too. So this was really, I love the house of sand and fog. So this was really an honor. Well, thank you. I, I will tell you that I, I say that I will ruthlessly exploit anyone who's willing to help the program. Program. So you'll probably be hearing from me again. Don't think you're off the hook. Good. <laughs> really pressured. I see we have a lot of thanks so much. This was amazing from our attendees and thank lots of great advice. So once again, you're a hit.
Okay, to pick that up every every forum you go into. So here you are again. Thanks a lot. All right, thanks everyone for joining us. We'll see you soon at our next discovery session, and we will just watch Kelly's career continue to skyrocket. Thank you. All right, bye everyone. Thank you.